Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Woodworking Wisdom. Today we're looking at, um, at wands, uh, uh, wizards and witches' wands. Um, and I want to show you a few techniques that I use to, to, uh, to make these wands. Um, and we're going to look at lots of different stuff today. Um, just really introducing you to a few techniques, a few little things um, that you know might be able to help you. And um, I did make a load of wands a while back. We, we've turned some wands and we've um, and I kind of whittle ones as well. Um, I've not got many to show you, so that kind of um, you know explains how much people uh, are wanting these things. They see them and they're they're going to ask you for them. Um, like I say, a few techniques, and I, I wanted to um, come away from the from the turning a little bit today. Um, we we are going to have a look at a bit of that, um, but not actually physically turn any wood today. Um, we're going to make some handles. We're going to join a few bits together, and hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration so you can because you can go away and make your own. Um, okay, so let's come over to the bench here. Um, I've got a few bits I've prepared. So. Um, what we're going to do to start off with, I'm going to make a little handle, okay? It's not really showing very well on camera here, but um, I've marked out a, camera, uh, a handle on the end here, and I've been through a few designs. So I've um, looked at the, the size of the handle. I've literally put that down on my piece of paper and, and just drawn it around. And I've also kind of measured up my hand against it. So. You know, so it's going to sit comfortably in, in my hand, but everyone's hands are different sizes. Um, and the, the beauty of these ones is you can make them for, you know, for adults, for, for kids, you know, any Potter fans out there. You know, sometimes we make smaller ones, um, for, you know, for the little ones. Um, but, you know, you can take that into, into account and, um, and make them whatever size you like. Um, first thing I've got to do is just cut this off this piece of timber. This is the kind of waste, but I could get another couple of handles out of that if we, if we save that. So we'll put that to one side for a moment. Um, and I just want to cut the end off of this one. So holding it nicely in the vise there, I'm going to grab my um, the Japanese saw. Really nice to use this one. And I'm just bringing my thumb now up to where I want to put the cut. The, um, the teeth on the saw just to engage and we're going to bring that back and forth. Cuts on the pull stroke and I've just moved my body out of the way so I've got a nice um, nice clear path for the handle of the saw just to go through. I want to cut this fairly square. Of course you could cut this on the um, scroll saw on the band saw if you've got one. Um, just nice and easy job with that little Japanese saw there. Okay. So what we want to do, um, I've got a little twig here that I've picked up. And what we want to do is just drill a hole down into the handle here where we can put this little twig. And I've selected this one. It's nice and strong. It's not been lying on the, um, you know, with all the leaf litter. I've, um, you know, I've picked it up nice and fresh, um, so it's it's nice and strong. It's not rotten away, um, so it will it will take a bit of a, a bashing. Um, so all I've done is I've looked at the diameter here, and that's just under nine mil. Okay, so I've got a nine mil drill bit. I'm going to put my um, wand handle in the vise. And I'm trying to keep it fairly straight in the vise. That will give me um, a straight at 90 degrees when we drill into it. Um, a lip and spur type drill bit. And what this is going to do is going to give me the flat bottom in the, in the bottom of the hole. Okay. One thing I just wanted to do, if we look at how far this is going to go in, I've got a bit of a shape on the handle of this one. And I want that stick to kind of go in a certain amount. So what I'm going to do is just light the drill um, down on the workpiece, and I'm looking to where the bottom of the little line I've drawn is going to go. And I'm just going to lie my drill there. I'll get a bit of tape. <coughs> Excuse me. It's going to snip that one off. And this is going to give us like a little depth gauge of how far we want to drill in. So he's going to about there. 
And we don't have to be, you know, too precise. What we don't want to do is just drill it too deep because we want that bottom surface to be able to glue to as well. Let me swing that around so we can see what we're doing. And again, just want that nice and straight in the vise. And I want to keep the drill nice and straight as well. We're going to head for, for centre. I've got a nice little um, the lip and spur. I'm just going to get that spur and just kind of eye it up on a centre point. And that looks pretty good. So, still running at full speed, keeping it nice and straight. And just taking it down to that little tape mark. Good. Now, like I say, we're going to cut some of this away, and that um, drill hole should be down in the handle here. I'm going to do a little test fit with my stick and look at that just the job it fits in there really nice um, and with a little bit of glue that's going to expand both of these faces and really hold that tight so just have a quick little sort out put my drill away and we can head over to the um to the scroll saw um just going to grab my goggles here them on and protect our eyes. Um, set up in the um, in the table in the in the holders here. I've got my modified geometry number five. Um, really nice blade, just to cut this outside um, shape. Um, we've got Colwyn on the questions today. So any questions you have, um, please just pop them in the comments, and we'll do our best to answer. Good. So my speed is uh, just under half way. And where I'm going to start is where the handle comes up to meet the edge of our blank. And I'm going to rest the blade on the side of the project and just gently steer it in. I've got quite a nice heavy line on this. Found it, couldn't really see it on camera unless I really put it on there thick. And little projects like this can be a little bit tricky to hold, especially with your guarding and stuff in place. But just switching your grip as you go, taking it nice and slow. And keeping that pressure down onto the table of the scroll saw. Good. I'm going to use the back of the project just to flick that piece of waste away. And I don't know if you can see, but we've got a really nice clean cut off that number five modified geometry blade. I'm going to come down here now. So we're going to be cutting through the hole that we drilled. And just slowing down at the end of the cut. Although it's waste there, it's just good practice um, just to slow down towards the end of the cut. And the, the blade doesn't kind of pop out and um, give you that breakout on the side. This is just a piece of tulip. The timber we use a lot of here. And it's probably just over 20 mil thick. So a breeze for the, the scroll saw, which can take up to up to 50.
Good. Just using, again, using the waist just to, to push that away. Um, so we've got a kind of a hook shaped on the end here. I'm coming round that curve, coming quite close to the edge of the blank. I'm just trying to stay, keep the cut in the blank so we don't pop out and have that little line on the edge. And then I'm going to do almost like a little relief cut up this way. And then that curves on the inside so we can swing that around quite quickly. And that's where a scroll saw really kind of comes into its own, is cutting those super tight curves. And again, I'm coming towards the edge now, so I'm just slowing right down. If the blade pops out, it will leave a little ridge. So I'm trying to kind of cut my way out. And you can see it's left a little ridge there. But that's nothing we can't sort out with a bit of abrasive um, in a moment. Rather than trying to cut that off in, in one or two uh, passes, I would just sand that in. And you can see why we drilled that hole first. Um, you know, trying to drill an, uh, with, uh, into a face that's on an angle um, will sometimes really throw the drill bit out. Okay, so we've got a kind of shape to the handle of our wand now. Um, next thing I want to do is um, I want to put a little bit of um, a resin infill in this. So I've drawn a little kind of snake on the end of the handle there. And um, we're going to fill that up with some really interesting resin in a minute. Um, but first of all, we need to do that kind of um, internal cut. Um, so to be able to do that, we need to, to drill a hole in it. And I've set up a, a very small, thin drill bit. Um, in the in the pillar drill. So I'm just going to quickly drill that. I'll be right back with you. Sorry for showing you my back. Again, I'm using that lip and spur type drill bit. A really nice thin, that's about a three mil drill bit. And it's supported underneath. So we don't get any of that kind of breakout on the underside. It's giving us a nice clean exit. And that's really important as well. So it's not going to rock on those um, kind of broken out fibers. OK, so we have our first question. Hi, everybody. Yeah, a couple of questions here. Jim B was just asking, he says, where does all the tulip wood keep coming from? You guys seem to use a lot of it. Maybe you want to explain a little bit about the tulip and why we use it? Yeah, so um, tulip is... Um, is, it's really easy to get hold of here. Um, we, we use a lot of it, and it's good for lots of different processes. It's a, it's a hardwood, um, but it's fast growing, um, and it's, it's very available. Um, we've got stacks of it out the back. We buy it in bulk, and of course, that's the, the cheapest way to buy these things. And again, we're very lucky we've got all the machinery we need to, to process that. So we've got the big table saws, we've got the planar thicknesses. Um, so for us, um, rather than buy um, ready prepared timbers, um, where uh, you know a lot of work's been done on it and that incurs a cost, um, we can buy these boards in uh, bulk and, um, and rough sawn. Um, so it's a great timber for us. Um, we, again, you know, Craig with his uh, planar thicknesser and his band saws and table saws, um, can just we can process it so quickly, um, and it's ready for all of our different um, all our different projects. We saw Jason making a table in it um, just yesterday. Um, Colwyn sometimes uses it for his turning, um, but it's a really good stable timber. It doesn't warp too much. It doesn't seem to um, be affected too much by the kind of humidity and the dryness. Um, so it's 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 great for lots of different jobs for us. Uh, tulip or poplar. Okay, so another question. Yeah, Paul's just asking, um, would it help with the marking if you used a marking knife? Would the blade follow that mark then? 
Um, potentially. Um, I've, I've never really used a marking knife, and there's quite a lot of um, curves and, and things going on in this one. And I find sometimes as you twist the carve, uh, a marking knife, um, it could potentially just throw uh, the tip out because um, it's twisting in the grain. And also, um, yeah, it, it, it will kind of drag as I twist it, a bit like my pyrography tips I use. Sometimes with those sharp tips, as you turn it, it kind of the back end of it kicks out and it will um, just make a very slight mark on the surface. Great for, for, for sharp, clean, straight lines and marking off square and things like that. Um, but something a little bit more intricate like this, um, sometimes it can be a little bit fiddly. Okay, good. Um, so we've drilled our hole um, through our project. Um, next thing I want to do, let me see if I've got my blades. I'm just going to grab my spiral blades, just a moment. So um, spiral blades here, what have we got? We've got a zero and a number three. I'm going to go with the number three. Um, slightly less teeth, so it'll be not quite as clean a finish, um, but it's going to work a little bit quicker for us. So spiral blade, much like your normal blade, but just twisted round and round and that cuts in all different directions, which is going to be great for this, um, this little snake we got here. I'll just pop them to one side. Just check which way the teeth are running, so I can bring my hand along them this way, but not that way. That's the teeth are facing down there. So off with our tension, which I've already done, and we're just going to pull this modified geometry number five out. Again, just making sure the teeth are running the right way and setting that in the bottom clamp. And when clamping these, I always just clamp it up and then just take the, um, the clamping knob or just that little bit further. So it really grips on. It's really annoying actually when you, you know, when you get going and um, the, the clamp lets go. And you can quite often break a blade that way. So, sorry, blades going through the project, through that little hole I've just drilled. And then pop it back in that blade clamp and just making sure that it's got the blade, that the blade's not on edge in there with that twist. So nice, firm, tighten up, and we're ready to go. I can just grab my goggles. Um, keep hold of the project when you, when you get going, uh, when you start the machine, I should say. And I'm going to start off coming down the body of this snake. And like I say, this will cut in any direction, so I no longer have to, um, you know, twist the project around, which is really handy in this um, circumstance. There's not actually a, a whole lot to grip onto. And perhaps it would have been a better idea to have um, cut this one out first, uh, while the handle was uh, was square. And I'm not being too precious about sticking to the line. I'm cutting most of the pencil line away. Um, but this is an organic shape. This snake with its twists and coils. So we don't have to be um, perfectly in our lines. Just going to adjust my grip, keep that pressure down whilst I'm doing it. I 
and this um, spiral blade gives a bit of a round cut. So it's got quite a soft, rounded end of the tail. Um, if you're a bit of a perfectionist, you can come back in with your um, sharp blade and give that a real nice point. So it's just popped out of the cup there. So that's fine. I'm going to bring my blower in a bit. And I would keep this detail quite small and fine. We, um, we're going to fill this with resin in a bit. And we don't want to use too much resin if we can help it. So just trying to get the whole of that blade working. Instead of it just kind of glancing off the workpiece. Try and get that embedded in. And I'm just opening out this cut a little bit. Okay. So I'm just rotating the workpiece so I can get a better view of the shape of the head. And I'm not going to worry about doing the eyes on this first run round. I'm just going to get the shape of that head in. And then we can revisit it and um, do the little eye detail. So coming back into his neck there. Well, do snakes, snakes have necks? They're one one big neck. And I'm just trying to open this up a little bit. Using that round blade. And a little bit here, I just want to tidy up because it was just popping out of the cut there. So gently using a bit of kind of sideways pressure to just tidy up that cut. It's quite a tricky thing to get into once you're um, once you've done that. Okay, so oh sorry, I've not done his eyes. Let me just do quickly put them in. Tension back on. And let's just bring that blade back up to the head and um, put those little eye details in. We've got one here. And I'm just, again, just resting the blade in that location where the eye should be. I'm giving it a little wiggle, encouraging it to take out some of that material. Good. So we've got our little snake in there. And uh, another question. Yeah, Paul's just asking again, is there an issue with scratching on the table, on that table? Um, I believe that there's some sort of epoxy coating on it. Is there a... um, so they've usually got some sort of high gloss um, finished paint. It's a very hard wearing paint. Uh, almost a metallic paint. Um, it will wear over time, um, and quite often you'll see these bits. Um, you know where, you, where people who do a lot of scrolling um, will will wear it out, and you'll they'll almost polish the table using the timbers um, for it swinging around here and here. Um, slowly, this will wear, 
Um, there's not a great deal you can do about it. I wouldn't recommend um, putting a top layer um, epoxy or anything on it um, because that can be um, quite grippy and um, you want this kind of non-slip type of um, material. Sometimes uh, waxing it will, will kind of rejuvenate it, um, a little bit of wax. If you find it's really grabbing, um, a little spray of uh, PTFE sometimes can, can kind of um, help things glide a little bit better on the table. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it, it is very hard wearing. This one uh, we've had about six years and it gets a kind of medium use. I would say, you know, once or twice a week, um, it's getting it's getting used um, and probably for about a couple of hours at a time. Um, but yeah, there's there's no way of um, of stopping that happening really. Um, it's it's just maintaining the machine. Um, and if you do lose that top layer, this is a steel plate under here. So just um, you know keep it dry. Um, you know wax it if you're not using it and it's going um, you know back in the shed potentially for for a few weeks um, just just keep it maintained and, um, and and don't allow it to kind of rust once you get those pits and stuff on the table that's when you'll really struggle to um, to maneuver things okay good um, so we've got our little um, our little handle on the go here we've just pop that snake shape in. I'm not sure, let me bring it over to the other camera actually. So we're coming over to our um, main camera there. So we've got that little snake shape in and we can put files and stuff in there if we wanted to um, just change things up a bit. We wanna put some, um, some epoxy in there next, okay? And I've tried this um, using pyrography and things. Um, you know, I, I like using pyrography, so quite often um, I try to do a really a, a deep burn into this and fill that with epoxy. Um, but when taking off that top layer, it pulls it all back out. Um, so, you know, a bit of trial and error, um, again, with these little kind of magic symbols, um, sanding it and scraping it with a cabinet scraper, neither seem to really work. Um, so going right through the project, um, is the way I found, and um, it gives that really nice, um, you know, that really nice deep color from the from the epoxy. So you could use whatever epoxy you've got. Um, there's all sorts of little additives and things that you can get for these epoxy. I'm using a, a glow in the dark one, so um, you know it gives it that little bit of a more of a magical kind of feel to things. Um, any breakout on the back here, I just want to get rid of that. Any of these loose fibers, again, just get a bit of abrasive in there and, um, and try and clear those away the best you can. Just that a little blowout. And I'm just going to use my number five on there and just poke through any kind of loose debris that may be sat in there. I want this nice and clean as well. We don't want um, to mix dust in with our epoxy. And like I say, this is a glow in the dark one. You can get that as an additive. Uh, this one is, is kind of pre-mixed, so the lid's fallen in. And you can see the consistency of this stuff. It's kind of like um, caramel would be the best way to describe it. Let me get my bit of tissue here. And it can be quite messy. Okay, so I'm just gonna put a bit of tape on the back side of this um, to help contain that epoxy. So really kind of um, laying that down and pushing it on to stop any potential leakage. And then what else have we got? I need to give that a little stir because the pigment generally settles down the bottom. Um, I was using a stirring stick um, before and I snapped it in the pot because it's quite thick stuff, quite thick and gloopy. Um, I'm sure you could pop it in a, a bit of warm water. Um, just to 
kind of make it a little bit more easy to use. And I'm just scooping off the excess there. Like I say, some of these resins can be a bit expensive, um, so we don't want to waste any. Good. So I've got my little, um, this is the back end of a silly brush, much like a little glue spreader. Um, so I'm going to get a bit of that. Not too much at first. We don't want to spread it as much on the on the surface if we can help it. And just kind of push that in. But you can um, you can get all sorts of additives for these. Um, we've seen glitters. This is a glow in the dark. Um, you could have your, you know, your your favourite colours. There's all sorts of stuff you can do with this. The alcohol inks are really cool for those kind of galaxy type looks. It almost looks airbrushed, but worth um, worth looking into that. So I would keep going with that and keep pushing it in. As um, you know, if you wait a couple of minutes, you'll see that level kind of drop. Just keep adding more. And this has got about a 45 minute um, set time, this one. Oh, I'll tell you what I haven't done. Getting a bit carried away. I haven't added the hardener. So <laughs> sorry about this, folks. So uh, put a splodge of it on your um, on your bench there, on your um, mixing um, palette. And this is um, one part hardener to four parts of the epoxy. So give that a good mix. Sorry, that was silly of me. I got, got ahead of myself there. So get a good mix and that actually makes it a lot more easy and pliable a bit thinner that needs to be mixed really well and that will sink in just that bit better so it's going to have a liquid middle this one i expect because what we'll probably find is on the other side there's a little air pocket and usually I would fill it from one side. You can kind of check it at the bottom and then you may need to take that bit of tape off and just apply some onto the bottom. Okay. Um, so hopefully you can see, um, if we were to get rid of that on the top there, we're going to have a really cool kind of glow-in-the-dark snake once it's done. Again, just getting off in the excess. There we go. It's not really showing on that camera. Let's bring it up to um, our camera there. So you can see that sinking in. It's starting to fill that, um, that little gap we've got and when we come and clean this up um, we'll take that back and we'll get a lovely um, kind of inset um, little snake okay so another question yeah just a couple one one on the um, the, the resin itself to start with um, so Maria was saying uh, what's the shelf life on the premix epoxy uh, we now know it's not a premix so there is a hardener to go with it yeah um, but you know, roughly what is the shelf life before hardener? Um, we've had this about a year. It's still pretty good. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Do you know that one, Colin? Uh, it's, so that one's a different um, a different type to the eco epoxy uh, casting resin. The casting resin, um, I've had some over a year. If Sometimes they can go cloudy and they start to crystallize. If that happens, then you put them in... Um, put the actual container in, in hot water and it will go back to liquid again. 
Um, but I, yeah, I would say a couple of years, and I'd want to use it by then. To be to be fair, yeah. And just go over the drying time again. What was the drying time on that one? So this one's forty eight hours. So it is a quite a long um, drying time. That's a kind of working um, drying time. So if you um, you know, it will feel tacky and it will feel dry um, before that. Um, and, you know, you can touch it. It feels dry to the touch. Um, but for it to fully harden, um, it's a good um, a couple of days, 40, 48 hours. Um, and just like Colin was saying, we use, um, I use epoxy resin a lot to glue pens and things like that. Um, the five-minute epoxy. So something like this. Um, use that one on loads and um, again that can kind of crystallize just pop it in a mug of hot hot water um, and that softens it right back up it's still still good to use okay uh, Paul was asking just going back to the ta the table on the um, the scroll saw there can they be replaced if, if needed they, um, I'm pretty sure they can um, if it's if it's one from us um, speak to our customer services quite often we'll have um, you know, returns on certain machines and there will be spares available. Um, and quite often they can order new tables. Um, there's quite, again, there's, there's a long wait usually for um, if you want them brand new. Um, but if you wanted to replace it, um, speak to customer services um, at Axminster. And quite often they'll, they'll have spares from, from other machines. Okay. Good. So um, I'm just going to use the rest of that resin while it's um, kind of liquid. Just going to kind of splodge it in there because why waste it? Um, but you get the idea. You want to fill that up. Um, if there's any um, bubbles and things like that, um, I tend to just prick them in this because they're usually quite a big bubble um, and it will just kind of settle back down. Um, so usually a little off cut of timber or, you know, for me, I've got my um, broken blades from the, from the scroll saw and thing. Just pop those, um, pop those little bubbles um, and that will settle it right down. Um, so I'm going to pop that to one side. Um, that would need shaping. You would want to take, um, you know, whatever your means of, of, of shaping to, um, to soften those hard edges on that. Um, and you can also 3D cut these handles. Um, so if you had a particular shape in, in mind, um, say you wanted to do like a 3D snake head, um, you could cut that on two different planes and give, you know, give yourself a real big head start uh, when it comes to, come to carving. Okay, so I wanna go to one that I've already prepared um, with a bit of resin in it. Um, I've had it charging up on the light here. So I'm going to take this one down. Um, and this is the wand. We, um, it's, it's the offcut of Alder, or Elder, sorry, um, that um, Jason gave me to turn the wand on the, on the last demo, the one we did on the lathe. Um, so this is the edge of the board. And I thought, actually, it's got quite a nice natural handle to it. Okay, um, there is um, a, a resin inset in here. Again, quite difficult to pick up on the camera, um, but we'll show you that in its full glory um, at the end of the demo. So let's do a little bit of uh, whittling or carving. So I've got my set of knives here. These flex cut knife sets are on a, um, are on a deal. They're 10% off at the moment. Um, whilst, you know, whilst they're in stock and that offer ends on the 17th of September. Um, but these are the little flex cut knives are really nice to use. So where do we start? I think we need to separate the handle from the main body of the wand here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is not to kind of come in on my resin there, but just behind it, I want to kind of mark off a little handle. So I'm pressing down onto the bench. Just going to bring that in. So the handle of my knife can just sit over the edge of the bench. So locate it there and I'm putting pressure down with my thumb and just rocking that knife back and forth. 
Okay, pressure's all going down. There's no way that's gonna kind of slip. I can now open that vise, get that in there. And again, I'm just gonna pick up on that line that we've marked and same again. Use a bit of pressure just to, to make a line across our piece of timber. Picking up on that line again and just kind of trying to keep it square to the rest of the rest of the wand. Good. Just going to go over that one again. And this is going to form like a little stop cut that we can bring just a few little cuts up to. Um, and it's going to create a little shadow line. And that should just be enough to kind of um, separate the wand blade from the handle. So really small controlled cuts. You can see how I'm holding the knife there. Um, my fingers, where I'm gripping it, is behind the project. One thumb on top of the other. And with this thumb locked, I can kind of pivot on that and just cut into the timber. If we need to just pair it off, we can do that. Again, just with a little downwards cut. Good. And now coming across the top here, just at a very slight angle to come down to the bottom of that stop cut and create that shadow line. So we're not carving lots of material away here. We're literally just taking a little skimming cut out just to suggest where the handle ends and the kind of blade of the wand begins. Good. If you need to just sever any fibers, line the blade up with the, um, the stop cut there and just push down both hands and that should just fall away those chips. I'm just going to take a little bit out of each corner as well. Good. Now to put a shape on this, I want to round over this edge. Okay, um, we've got two kind of hard edges um, here and here. Um, and also on the handle, we want to just soften that a little bit as well. So we're taking these kind of sweeping cuts away. Nice sharp knife. And I'm again hold gripping with one hand using the other thumb this time to kind of propel my right hand along rather than pushing with this hand and potentially slipping out the cut this thumb here is doing most of the work my left thumb so we're not having too much of a problem with grain or anything at the moment you can see This material just cutting nicely and we're knocking off that hard edge. And it's up to you again whether you want to kind of really smooth those lines in by just changing the angle you're presenting the, the knife to the workpiece, rotating the workpiece in your hand as you go to kind of give it that little radius. Just 
just softening those those kind of hard edges. The rest of the one I'm quite happy with. I quite like this kind of natural um, edge on here. Again, might take a little bit off of some of those those sharp edges just to make it more comfortable and more kind of tactile. And if you are doing any of these kind of resin infills, just be careful of the placement of them. We don't want them to, um, you know, you don't really want to be carving into them if you can help it. So it's still cutting nicely. I'm going to turn the wand around. Um, and you can see a little knot here. So effectively, where that knot's coming out, that's end grain. So you can expect the splinters just to kind of fall off as we hit the end grain there, because we're severing the, uh, the fibers up through. I don't know if you can tell, but we've left a little square edge uh, where, the, where the blade kind of begins. Okay, so another question. Yeah, just going back to the scroll saw again, Ben. Mm -hmm. um, Ian was saying that uh, he uses a record power scroll saw. Yeah. Do you know of any quick tension release adapter available that would fit just to speed up the blade release? I'm not sure on that one. Um, if you could send me a photo, if you send a photo into the Woodworking Wisdom, um, you know, our email, uh, woodworking wisdom at axminster.com um, or or just a description I can look it up online um, quite often there are adapters that um, that will fit different machines these Pegasus ones I know are available for um, for upgrading certain machines um, but I'd have to have a look at where um, you know how it all goes together on your on your record power one um, so unfortunately no I'm not I haven't got that machine kind of uh, in my head at the moment, um, but there are ones that are kind of not universal, but um, will fit lots of different machines. Um, so, yeah, send in um, the model number or a photo if you can, and um, and I'll get back to you on that. Cool. So we've we've softened that up. I'm just running my thumb along, just trying to feel for any. Um, kind of gnarly bits, working around these knots we've got. And you could whittle a, um, you know, a texture into the whole of this, if you like. It comes off quite quickly once you get into the swing of it. You know, you can really kind of horse off the material. Um, what I would say, if you find that each of these are kind of trying to cling on, and they're, they're not coming away properly, it probably means you need to start working the knife the other direction um, and going with the grain um, so you're not pulling any fibers out. If you're hearing a lot of the kind of fibers cracking as well as they come away, um, it's probably an indicator that we need to go the other way. So that carves a lot easier in that direction, which probably means the grain's coming out that way. And the grain can do all sorts of funny things around these knots. Um, so again, you sometimes you can get the feel for it. Or if it's feeling difficult to carve, then um, you know, just try going the other direction. So that's one way of, of, of shaping your wand. Um, you know, that quite quickly, I've, I've knocked all those um, hard edges off of it. It's got quite a nice um, kind of um, faceted look to it. And I wouldn't sand all that off. I quite like some of that, um, you know, that hand um, shaped material. Um, something else I want to show you, if you're as impatient as me, um, another little tool I like to use a lot is the, the power file. And this one can really take that off in seconds. Okay, so just coming in a little bit closer there. And I may 
if you don't mind, just bring that camera up a touch. Good. Okay, so we have another question. Yes, Maria is asking, can you show us your method of sharpening the FlexiCut knife, please? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. So, got my knife here. Let's have a look in my drawer. So, I've got a big strop. Um, a bit of the flex cut honing paste. Um, quite often they'll come with with one like this. I quite like the um, you know the, having that extra length just to take it right the way across. So that is just a leather strop, okay? And you can get these in all sorts of places. You could probably use the back of your belt, um, that kind of, the kind of fluffy side. All right, I've seen that um, a lot. Um, and the way I would do it. To be honest, I would probably whack it on the Tormek, on the, um, you know, the, the kind of mechanized um, buffing wheel of the Tormek, because um, that makes it a really easy job. Um, but um, strop with a bit of that honing um, soap on it, which is like a mild abrasive, um, and you can just run the blade away from you so the cutting edge is kind of facing inwards and just run that away from you keep them sharp that's the um the trick with these knives um hone them after if you've you've used them and um you know keep them sharp bringing it back the other way and just finding the bevel it's quite a large bevel on these knives um, so just, it's quite easy to find, just rock the knife a little bit, rest it on that bevel, and either bring the knife towards you if the cutting edge is out, and away from you when that cutting edge is in. And that will just polish it, and keep them, keep them honed. That's the trick with all of these. Um, if you get a chip, or something like that, it might be worth taking it to the, um, you know, to a grinder, but quite a difficult angle and also a difficult thing to hold in a jig. Um, so also diamond stones, things like this. If you've got a bit more material to come off, uh, water stones, all of those sorts of things. Um, so that's a little diamond stone there uh, with the cross hatching. And it's the same thing. You just put that on the bevel, take it away, you might want a little splash of water on there to kind of flush the um, the metal that you're you're taking off. Okay. Um, but yeah, to be to be honest, I give them a little a quick whiz on the tormac on the um, on the leather hone. But I, I realise we're all um, very lucky to have all those kind of tools. So what were we doing? Let's get back to our handle. So we've done that. I was going to have a go with the power file. That's where we're at. So this is a little Stanley um, kind of bull and knuckle type um, clamp. So you can position this any which way you want. Um, and I've just clamped that to a bit of wood in my vise. Again, this is the power file, okay? So really nice little tool. It's basically a really thin little belt sander. Pull the trigger and the little belt goes round and round. And you can whiz these things in seconds. Um, I'm gonna put my goggles on. Um, sometimes um, if, if you're doing a big job, it's worth having an air filter. This does have a little kind of cyclone um, collector for your dust. Okay, but wear a dust mask, um, have an air filter if you can. So a tool like this will save you so much time, but it will give you a very kind of smooth finish. If you want that kind of whittled look, and I would carry on with those knives, until you're kind of happy with the shape. But really quickly, I've got a radius on that. Really easy, really user-friendly. 
going to bring my cable up round. Good. So that's giving me a really nice little radius across the top there now. It'll be really comfortable to, to handle. We're running away with time a little bit, but um, you can use all sorts of decoration on this. If you wanted to stain the handle, you could use a spirit stain, um, something like that. Um, this will take an oil really nicely. Um, don't worry about your... Um, your resin in underneath, the oil's not going to affect that anything. Um, just don't allow it to pool if it's um, just below the surface. Just want to wipe off that excess. Um, but you can use pyrography on these. Um, let me just turn that one on. And I just want to pick out something along those lines um, to make it a bit more obvious um, where our um little i guess it's a rune a little magic rune so i'm just going to bring that along and kind of underline this rune and then hopefully make it a little bit more obvious so i'll just put a little line alongside my resin be careful not to burn the resin. We don't want that, um, you know, a knot of nice um, smoke's going to come off that. So be very careful. And also, we don't want to affect the kind of finish. So I'm just really scooting around this. Got my writing style tip in. So it's not sharp. I'm just picking out some of this kind of detail. And then bring that along there and just fill that in. And they make quite cool little markings of their own, almost the negative of the uh, rune I've put in there. And I'm going to just bring that out a bit. This is the, the fire writer. And I think I'm just going to do a little kind of half circle um, under each of these. OK, join that on there. Now, I just want to give that a little charge with some lights. So again, we've got our, I've raided the um, photography studio. I'm going to pop a light on there, give that a little charge. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, is there any other questions, Colwyn? We're, we're good for questions. Um, so like I say, there's lots of different techniques you can use um, when making these ones. Um, the, the one we did earlier, where we did the handle, we filled that with resin. Um, that's going to take a little bit of time to dry, especially as I didn't put the hardener in there. But that top layer is going to um, it's going to dry off. We can flip it over and kind of encase that on the other side, so it's not a wasted project. Um, the 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 stick that we're going to glue in there, we're just going to use a bit of um, again. I'd probably use an epoxy um, type glue, but you could use um, your your PVA or super glue, something like that. Um, and you know, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. Um, you know, allow your creativity to kind of um, just run wild, and um, hopefully, you know, you can make some make some neat stuff. And people really enjoy um, these ones. Like I say, I've made loads now, and they keep going out the door. Um, people tend to uh, to really appreciate them. So, let's have a look at a bit of the magic. Um, I've, I'm just charging my my um, wand here. I'm going to turn some lights off. So excuse me, just a moment. It might go a bit dark. Okay.
And let's have a little look. I'll bring the wand up here. And you can see that little rune just in the middle there. Um, and with a little bit more charge, that will really kind of set that off. Um, and a really cool thing for someone, um, you know, to be able to use their, their magic wand, it gives it that kind of magic feeling. Okay. Good stuff. Um, so, like always, um, if, you, if you've enjoyed the demo, uh, please hit the like button. Um, don't forget to subscribe for more of this uh, free content on turning, machining, there's uh, all the hand tools. Um, but come back and see us again. Um, we'll see you soon.